Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Sneblin from With One Accord Ministries, and we're presenting here tonight a, another teaching in our, in our category of spiritual warfare tools, deliverance tools, and ways to protect yourself and your family from the attacks of the evil one. And tonight, we're going to talk basically about two things that are very much related. One of them is uh, the concept of unrighteous soul ties, which hopefully many of you know about, but we're going to drill down a little deeper on it. And then we're also going to talk about one of the principal spiritual warfare tools that our Heavenly Father has provided for us to eff effectively, you know, shatter these unrighteous soul ties. So without ado, let's get into it. What, you may ask, is an unrighteous soul tie? Well, we've been writing about this and talking about this in one form or another since the probably 1989, 1990. And finally, in our book, Blood on the Doorpost, and in several videos we mention it, but, but the idea here is that when two people come together, most especially on a sexual nature, in a sexual nature, if they, um, if they have intercourse, or if they indulge in, you know, less extreme forms of intimacy, what, what in, in my day used to be called petting, uh, you know, things like that, uh, kissing of an intimate nature. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, like giving your, your grandma a peck on the cheek. Uh, things of that kind, these can create unrighteous, uh, well, they can create soul ties. They can be good soul ties or they can be evil soul ties. It all depends on the context, as we shall see. Now, the scriptures tell us that the marriage bed is undefiled. So, obviously, if you are married, um, you know, to one wife, one husband, you know, none of this polygamy garbage. We're going to do a teaching on polygamy, by the way, in another couple of videos, but that's still in the pipeline. Uh, but just to make that clear, the marriage bed is undefiled. That means that if two people have come together and before their union they were, you know, virgins, which is what Yahoo intends, but obviously it's, it's a little rare nowadays, then there's no worry, you know, uh, because there's no unrighteous soul ties in the marital union. But, if you come, let's say you're, you know, a 20, 25-year-old guy and you get saved and then you find a wonderful girl and you want to marry her, but it turns out that is, is often the case in adolescence, you were out there sowing your wild oats and you've had various degrees of intimacy with other girls before you married your wife. Now, whether or not your wife was a virgin, that doesn't enter into it so much at this point point. The point is you have unrighteous soul ties with those earlier women because here's how it works. And this is why chastity is such a highly important value to our Heavenly Father. When you have relations with a woman outside of the, of the marital bond, you create an unrighteous soul tie with that woman or man, whichever. I mean, we're talking also homosexuality, or so it could be a woman-to-woman -woman thing, it could be a man-to-man -man thing, or it could be, you know, the usual heterosexual thing. Anyway, that creates an unrighteous soul tie, and that here's what that means. Now, I want you to listen carefully if this is a new idea for you, and for some of you it may be. What happens is any evil spirits that were in that other party, man or woman, doesn't matter, are going to pour into you through that marital union because the two of you have become besar echad, one flesh. That's what it says in the Torah, and Yahushua echoed it in his, in his teaching, that the two become one flesh. You become one, both in the literal sense but also in the spiritual sense. Your, your bodies are one, your souls are one, and your spirits are one. And this is true whether it's under the, the chuppah, the canopy of the marriage covenant, or whether it's a one-night stand with a girl in the back of a Ford, uh, or even with, yah forbid, a prostitute. Any one of these things will occasion this bond, this, this link. And imagine, for example, 
if you, if you as an adolescent or in college or whatever, you went to a prostitute, that woman has probably a bazillion demons in her because she's had probably sex with hundreds of guys, most of whom, well, all of whom are also full of demons. And demons are like the ultimate venereal disease, a sexually transmitted disease. And this sounds bizarre, but it's true that if you, when you have sex with someone outside of marriage, you're having sex with every other person they ever had sex with. And all the demons that were in all of those people are going to just pour into you. And then you wonder, why do so many people struggle with bondage, with demonic infestation, with bondage to pornography or masturbation or, or you know, what, what is now called sexual addiction? Um, this is why. It's because if they have ever had relations with a person outside of marriage, and let's say that person goes on and they may straighten out their lives, they may get married, they may even get born again and get married. It doesn't matter. All the demons that are in that individual are going to still be pouring into you throughout the rest of your life. All the way up to when you're 60, 70, 80 years old. It does not matter unless you pray and break unrighteous soul ties. This is so critical. And yet probably three-fourths of people in the body of Messiah do not understand this. And this is more nuanced, and we're going to get into some of the, the, the degrees of it in a minute, but, but I want you to just understand the basic premise. So in other words, if you have had relations outside of marriage, every person that that other party has had relations with, all of their demons are going to pour into that person, and they are in turn going to pour into you. And condoms don't help. Uh, birth control doesn't help with this. It's a spiritual thing. It doesn't matter whether you're using birth control or not because the fact of the, and it doesn't even matter if you perform what is technically called coitus interruptus where the, the man you know, pulls out at the last minute. Doesn't matter. You know, any kind of intimate contact is gonna create this unrighteous soul tie. So you need to be aware of this and you need to repent of it. Now, we have the prayers to do this on our website, the prayers to break unrighteous soul ties. It takes maybe five minutes, and it can change your life. Now, some people may need more than that. They may need other, other deliverance prayers, and we also, on our website, have all the prayers for deliverance. We have a, a complete deliverance protocol to deal with you know, breaking um, generational sins from your ancestors, ancestral curses, with uh, getting rid of uh, repenting and getting rid of the demons from religious sins, like if you were in a false religion, like the Mormons or the Catholics or the Jehovah Witnesses, or something of that nature, or if you practice the occult, all of that is covered under religious sins. Then you have non-religious sins, uh, and this would be things like, um, well, like fornication, like adultery, like homosexuality, masturbation, uh, anger, bitterness, rage, or, or things like having abortion, um, things of that, and obviously something like, you know, murder or, or manslaughter, anything like that, any violation of the, of, of the commandments. So you can pray through that. But then, then if the fourth section we have people do is to break unrighteous soul ties. Now, if you've lived a relatively, you know, sin-free life other than your sexual irregularities of your youth, you could probably just do the generational sin prayer and then go right to the, um, the unrighteous soul ties prayer. But in most cases, I just recommend people go through all through the whole thing carefully and prayerfully because sometimes you've done stuff. A lot of us did really dumb things when we were adolescents. And sometimes you forget about them. And pray and ask the Ruach to set apart spirit to bring them to mind and you'll, you'll, you'll be convicted of these things. So that's the basic concept. But it gets, as I said, a little more complex because there's more than one kind of human relationship, both for good and for bad. And now remember, as I go through these lists of possible unrighteous soul ties, that all of these things can be good. Like, for example, the teacher-student relationship. I had a couple of wonderful teachers in high school that really helped me uh, grow up, so to speak, and come out of my shell, as the saying goes. And I'm sure I have a uh, soul tie with 
that uh, this one particular male teacher I recall. And, you know, that's fine. That's not a problem. You know, nothing ever happened that was in any way out of line. The guy was a great guy. Um, so that's fine. But on the other hand, there are sometimes unwholesome relationships that develop in various categories, and we're going to be talking about them. But first of all, you need to understand that you need to break these, um, these relationships off, both literally. I mean, in other words, it goes without saying that if you're, let's say you're a single man or a single woman and you're in fornication with another person, or if you're, you know, a homosexual and you're whatever, it doesn't matter. You need to cut off that relationship physically right away and do teshuva, repent of it, and ask the Father to forgive you. You know, because that's very serious sin. Now, beyond that, you need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with that individual. Now, I recommend, I mean, if I do, you know, marital counseling or premarital counseling, we will always recommend that each party who's about to get married go through and pray and break unrighteous soul ties before they come together uh, in matrimony. And... Again, unless they both uh, know that they are virgins and so on and so on. Uh, and if so, that's fine. But they still might need for some of these other things to be prayed about. So we're going to look at this list and then explain this, this uh, important tool for, for breaking these things. First of all, understand that with the sexual relationships, I, I briefly mentioned this, but this can include non-coital intimacy. You can, in other words, if you're uh, doing deep kissing or if you're, you know, getting the other party's clothes off and touching them in areas that you shouldn't be touching them, uh, I'm not going to go any detail on it, but you understand what I mean. These can also create unrighteous soul ties. You don't have to have intercourse to do it. You could just get it through, have an unrighteous tie through, you know, non-coital forms of intimacy. So. You might still, if you're a woman, you might still, you know, be Virgo and Taptus, as they say, in a, in a physical sense, but emotionally and spiritually, no. You have an unrighteous soul tie, same is true of a guy, and you need to pray and break that. Okay, just to clarify that. And it goes without saying that sexual intercourse is the main way you get an unrighteous soul tie if it's done outside of the marital, marital bed. Okay, beyond that, strong friendship ties. I mean, if you, either as an adult or even as a child, if you had a really close friend, and I, I hope you did, you know, I hope you did, because that's a very valuable thing for young boys or young girls to have, is to have a, a buddy, to have a close friend that they can pal around with and do things with and so on. And as long as, you know, it was all innocent and childlike and whatever, that's probably fine, but sometimes they do things like, you know, these blood, I mean, I know when I was a child, this thing of doing a blood brother pack thing where each person pricks their finger and they put they put their fingers together like this, I think it was supposed to be based on some Native American thing, around, and you become blood brothers. Well, that creates a soul tie, and it might create an unrighteous soul tie depending upon variables, and here, as with all of these things we're about to talk about, you need to pray and ask the Ruach to lead you and to guide you into all truth. Because it's better to be on the safe side with these things. It might have been entirely innocent, but on the other hand, many of us lose touch with our childhood friends. And, you know, we our lives go one way and their lives go another way, and that's okay, but you may not know what that individual is doing now. So it might be prudent to, to pray and break those soul ties. Okay, another thing is filial relationships. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean parent and child. I mean, there is obviously very little that is more profoundly intimate than the parent-child relationship, particularly the mother-child relationship, because obviously the mother carries the baby within her for nine months, deep inside of her own body. This is a profoundly powerful soul tie. And it can be perfectly innocent. 
that's it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. There are a few things in the world that are more sacred than a mother-child bond or a father-child bond. That being said, though, if there's anything unwholesome, like, you know, there's a lot of people who their parents were not particularly righteous. They might have been, you know, drunkards. They might have been adulterers or fornicators or drug users. I mean, it's really sad, but, but this is very much the case, particularly my generation forward, going forward. You know, the, I mean, the... The kids, I mean, it started out in the 60s that all these different young people, myself included, started using drugs. You know, you know, whether it was pot or LSD or whatever, you know, and it really messes people up. And now that generation had babies, and, and now those babies have gone up and are the, I guess they're called the Gen Xers, I don't know. But anyway, the point is that any time your parents were involved in serious sin, or maybe they were in a cult. Maybe your parents were devout Catholics. Maybe they were devout Mormons. Maybe they were devout Jehovah Witnesses. Maybe they were witches. You know, it doesn't matter. Anything like that, you need to break unrighteous soul ties with your father and mother. And maybe you don't even know who your father is. Maybe you don't know who your mother is. Maybe they were, you know, killed when you were young. Maybe one or the other walked out on you. Maybe you're part of a blended family. It doesn't matter. You still need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with your parents and with your siblings because many people have wonderful relationship with their brothers and sisters. I happen to be an only child, but, you know, I know many people have wonderful things going on between uh, sibling relationships, and that's fine. But sometimes, not so much. Sometimes you got a, almost a Cain and Abel thing going on uh, or something in between or where one one sibling is saved and the other one isn't. Or one sibling is really, really following the Torah and the other sibling is in some yah-forsaken cult like the Catholic Church. And it's, again, you need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with that sibling. And let me say one other thing about this, because this can get a little complicated. What if you're adopted? Well, okay, here's the deal. You obviously need to break unrighteous soul ties with your birth parents, even though you don't know who they are. And that often is the case with people that were adopted as, as infants. Um, but beyond that, you need to realize that because of the legal procedures that your adoptive parents went through, I mean, they went to a court and they signed papers and, you know, da -da 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 -da, all the various legal things, which probably vary a little from state to state and country to country. But the fact is, Legally, they are your parents, even though they are not blood relatives. And so, you know, and hopefully they're fine people. But if there's something amiss that this rock shows you about this parent-child relationship, adoptive parent-child relationship, you would need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with these adoptive parents because the courts have created an artificial parent-child relationship there, which can mostly be a beautiful thing. But again, be sensitive to the leading of the, of the Ruach in these matters. Okay, another thing, and this can be huge, between pastor and flock. If you're in a church or whatever, I mean, it could be a, a Messianic synagogue, uh, whatever, you, maybe you have a rabbi, maybe you have a, just a congregational leader, maybe you have a pastor, it doesn't matter. You need to be aware that he may, he or she may be a wonderful man or woman of Yahuwah. But, you know, we advise people to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with these spiritual leaders. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of Yahuwah. None of us are perfect. Hopefully these pastoral and rabbis or whatever they might be, leaders, are trying their best to live a set-apart life. But as, as we know, it comes out in many of these um, cases where someone is involved in some sort of not-so-good thing. Maybe they're secretly a Freemason. That's a huge thing among many evangelical denominations, unfortunately, and especially among Baptists. The exception there being independent Baptists. Usually they aren't so much involved in Masonry, but most other Baptists, and Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, a lot of them are Freemasons. And that's really not good. That's a terrible thing to have over you. 
And we advise people, if you're in a, in a church where the pastor is a Freemason or whatever, get out. Just if you feel like you want to confront the man or woman first and, and discuss this stuff with them, we have a book, Masonry Beyond the Light, which is an excellent resource to share with them. Because some of them may not know. I don't know how they could be possibly a, a minister of the gospel and not understand how damnable masonry is, but there you go. I met many of them that just are absolutely clueless. It's like they have the spiritual discernment of a doorknob. And that's pretty sad if they're the leader of a church. But in any event, if you can't get them to repent, you just got to get out of the church. But even so, whether you stay or you leave, you need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with that pastoral leader or any other members of that congregation that might be involved in, you know, deacons, elders, stuff like that. Because these things can come back and haunt you later. Believe me. Again, I already mentioned this, but between teacher and student. And again, maybe there's nothing there. But if you if you had a strong, like, mentor-type association with one of your teachers, either in grade school or in high school, and you have reason from the rock to believe that there might have been, maybe it was not even on your part, maybe you were just this totally innocent young person, fine, but maybe there was something not right on the other end of the relationship. We don't know. I'm just suggesting that you pray about it. You ask the Ruach to lead you. And if the, if the Ruach shows you something, just pray through the prayer and break unrighteous soul ties with that teacher. Okay? Again, uh, between doctor and patient, another thing that's huge. Because with especially a doctor, and I, I've talked about this in other videos, but I just want to say it again. With doctors nowadays especially, we have infused the physician at least in America and in most Western societies, with an almost godlike power. I mean, it's like they can literally walk into a room and say some diagnostic thing that's really scary, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, the voice of the Almighty hath spoken right down from Mount Sinai, so to speak. That's not right. And some doctors are really good. They're fine people. Many of them are Christians. Many of them are trying to do their best in a manifestedly broken medical system here in America. But many of them are not so good. And many of them are involved as whatever, you know, Catholics, Mormons, Masons, Hindus, Jain. I mean, we, we're seeing a lot more ethnically diverse physicians in America, which is not necessarily a bad thing, except from the standpoint of spirituality. What if you have a doctor who's a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh or a Buddhist or a whatever, you know, or even a witch, you know. You need to pray and break any diagnoses that those men or women have given, spoken over you. And you need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with the doctors, with the clinics, with the hospitals because of the medical bureaucracy that we have in place in America. You've had to sign your name on a dozen forms to receive treatment in clinics, or especially if you ever have to be admitted to the hospital, yeah, forbid, you know, it can be a big deal with insurance and Medicaid and Medicare and da 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 da. So you need to renounce all those signatures, renounce all those contracts, and pray and break on the unrighteous soul ties with the doctor, the 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 physicians that that either examined you or took care of you or that you're, maybe you have a regular doctor with him too or her too. Because even if they might be good people, you don't really know their spiritual situation. You don't. Unless they happen to be a deep personal friend in addition to being your physician, you don't know. Even if they, they seem to be Christian, even if they have a little cross thing on the wall of their office or Sunday or scripture reading a plaque, you know, that's all well and good, but they could be Catholic. They could be Mormon. You don't know. So pray and break unrighteous soul ties. And I just say this. Say, <clears throat> excuse me, any possible unrighteous soul ties with Dr. Blah, blah. That's all you got to do. And then pray through the prayer. We have it on our website. Okay, another thing between counselor and counselee. Because, again, realize if you're going to a counselor... 
I mean, maybe you're going to a Christian counseling agency or maybe you're receiving counsel from a pastor. Um, still, you know, as we've said, we don't know for sure about these men and women. I mean, they could be secretly Masons. They could be any number of things. Um, and you can de develop a really close and possibly very positive and also possibly very unwholesome dependent kind of relationship with a pastor or a counselor. And that's not what Yahushua wants. He wants us to depend on him, not on some man or woman. So you may need to pray about breaking any unrighteous soul ties with a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with a, a counselor. Okay, then there, this is another big one for some people, fraternal ties. What do I mean by that? Well, the biggie, of course, is the Freemasons. Freemasonry and all its auxiliary bodies, if you don't know what I mean by that, I'm talking about, like, you know, there's the higher level things, like the Scottish and the York Rite, the Shrine, there's the Women's Group, the Order of the Eastern Star, the Daughters of the Nile, there's the, the adolescent groups like Rainbow Girls, um, uh, Damal Lay, Job's Daughters, if you're in any of those things, you need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with the Grand Lodges and Grand Chapters and whatever organizations you were in. Um, because these things are incredibly, incredibly toxic spiritually. You might as well be standing there, Christian man or Christian woman, and having someone pour tub after tub of cow maneuver over over you as being connected in any way with those organizations. I mean it. They are so spiritually toxic you have no idea. And, you know, many, many Christians have been involved in those things. Now, you need to renounce them and get out of them. You need to send them letters of demit. We have a sample letter in the back of our book, Masonry Beyond the Light. We also have one you can download for free off our website at withoneaccord.org. But, Beyond that, you need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with the worshipful master of your lodge, with the grand master of, of the grand lodge of the state, in my case it was uh, Wisconsin, in which you were a member. And, um, and the same thing would apply if you were in any of these ancillary groups like Eastern Star. Uh, and you know, if you're in them, you know what the organizational structure was. I mean, like in Eastern Star, they have a grand... A uh, worthy matron and a grand worthy patron over the whole state. And then they have a worthy patron and a worthy matron over the local organization that you were probably a member of, the chapter. Same thing with Scottish and York rites and all the rest, the shrine, all of that stuff. And yeah, willing, I'm going to do a YouTube video on the shrine and on masonry at some future point. Although we do have videos on these things that you can, I mean, DVDs you can get off our website, but. In any event, you need to break unrighteous soul ties with all these fraternal organizations. Also, lesser-known groups, like what I call the animal lodges. <clears throat> Things like the, the lions, the elks, the moose, the eagles. <laughs> they're not as toxic as the masons, but they're still s full of people. You have no idea who these people are spiritually. You know, you don't. And the same thing is true. The odds, the pardon me, the Odd Fellows Organization, uh, the Knights of Pythias, other such groups. I know some of these things. They're like, are they, they say, oh, we're just insurance organizations. You can join these fraternal groups and get like some special group insurance rate. Well, that might be, but the fact of the matter is, there's still a lot of spiritual toxicity in these things. Because what is, what does it Paul say in Second Corinthians six? Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. If you are in these groups, whether it's the Masons or the Odd Fellows or the Moose, or La you're yoked with a bunch of guys or women, as the case might be, it depends on the group, um, that are not necessarily born again. Many of them may be, many of them may not be, because they don't have religious litmus tests before you join these groups. They couldn't. It would probably be illegal. So you need to be careful of joining these things. And if you have joined them, I would recommend you get out of them. You know, send them a letter demanding to have your name taken off the rolls and sever all ties with them. And secondarily, 
pray and break unrighteous soul ties with the leadership of those organizations and with the other people in them. Simple as that. Now, another part of this thing, which some people overlook, are college fraternities and sororities. Okay, now, I know some of these things uh, are very benign. Uh, Alpha Phi Omega, I remember when I was in college, I never got into any of those things. I was too busy making movies and stuff, but in being a music major and a theology major at the same time. It takes up a lot of your time, let me tell you. But anyway, the point is, lots of guys and lots of women go through these things. Sororities, obviously, for women. Uh, the whole Greek system, fraternities for men. Don't do that. Take it from me. Don't. I don't care. It might be something very noble, but a lot of these fraternities are extremely unrighteous. I mean, you've seen news reports about, you know, hazing rituals, orgies. You know, I mean, believe it or not, when I went to college, which was in the late 60s, 1971, as I graduated, there was a um, fraternity on campus that was exactly like the fraternity in Animal House. I mean, that was, it was like watching, <laughs> going into a time machine. I was not a member, but I knew about it for reasons that are beyond the scope of this talk. I knew what was going on. And you don't want to be a part of that whether it's, you know, orgies or whether it's these weird hazing rituals that make you get drunk and roll around naked in the mud and people pee on you. I mean, just incredibly bizarre stuff. It's all a bunch of primitive, pagan, adolescent behavior of one-upmanship and ego, and you don't need that, especially if you're a believer. And if you did this back in your misspent youth and now you're a believer and maybe you're even Torah observant, hallelujah, you got to renounce these things. You've got to renounce all the, the, the memberships thing in the whatever fraternity you might have been in. You need to pray and, 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 pardon me, and also send them a letter asking them to take your name off the membership rolls. And finally, you need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with that fraternity or that sorority. Again, it doesn't matter if it was totally benign. It's still full of people that are unsaved, Remember 2 Corinthians 6. What concord hath Christ with Belial? What does Belial mean? It literally means worthless. These things are worthless. Okay. Another thing that many people forget is the military. If you're a veteran or if you're an active duty military person, Yahuwah bless you. We appreciate your service, but... You need to realize the Armed Forces is not a goody-two-shoes organization. Uh, as Rush Limbaugh has famously said, the Armed Forces basically exist to break things and kill people. And, you know, even though many soldiers are wonderful Christian men and women, many are not. And many people in the chain of command are not. Some of them are, some of them are, but the, that's the point. And I'm not saying if you're in the military, you need to get out of the military. I'm not. I'm saying to pray about it. Uh, but just realize that the leadership above you and also the, the horizontal, if you will, connections that you have, because I, I'm not a veteran, uh, but I have many friends who are, and I know there can be profoundly powerful friendship links, especially if you've been on the field of battle together, whether it was Vietnam or the first Gulf War, or the second Gulf War, or Afghanistan, or whatever, you can get incredibly tight relationships with these guys, and, and you know, women, you know, that is not in any way sexual or inappropriate. But sometimes these men or women are not particularly set apart. They might be great battle companions, but they're not set apart people. So I recommend both in terms of the, the chain of command above you and in terms of these guys that were usually their guys that are with you on the battlefield or women, doesn't matter. You need to pray and break unrighteous soul ties with your chain of command above you and the, the men and women you serve with. Because even if they were by and large great people, that doesn't matter. One rotten apple, as the saying goes, spoils the whole barrel. And when you put on top of that, now listen to this for a minute, because this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's important. In terms of her military service, if you have served either in, in Vietnam or in uh, the Gulf, you know, region, you know, whether it was Kuwait or Iraq or, you know, whatever, you know, these various theaters of combat, 
understand that you were serving on pagan foreign soil, whether it was the the Buddhist and animist over in uh, Vietnam and Laos, Cambodia, or whether it is the, the Muslims, etc., that are in the Middle East. You've got to be careful of that stuff spiritually. You've got to realize that all those times you were treading on the ground of something that was just literally infested with demonic power, especially in the Middle East. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, we have a DVD called Ancient Evil Modern Terror that explains the background on this. I don't have time to get into it in this teaching, but you need to pray about the spiritual toxicity that you were waiting around in over there, brothers and sisters. That's a whole different kind of phenomenon of what I'm talking about in this teaching, but just be aware about it. Pray about it and, you know, understand that you might need deliverance, not just because of like things like PTSD, which is a very real thing if you've been in combat, but also just because you were walking around over there for whatever, a year or two, or maybe more, in the enemy's kingdom. You know, whether that enemy was Allah or whether that enemy was, uh, you know, Buddha or whatever, all these, I'm not as familiar with the, uh, with the various small little animistic and Shinto and Buddhist type stuff over there in the Far East. But you get the point. You know, you need to pray over these things, seriously and ask Yahuwah to protect you and to cleanse you of those things, and also pray, as I mentioned, and break unrighteous soul ties. Okay, finally, I think, yeah, finally, the final thing, and again, we've mentioned this in a couple other videos, but I want to just mention it briefly here. We recommend that you pray and break contractual relationships. For example, with banks, with credit cards, you know, if you have a mortgage or, or a landlord, whatever, you know, all these different kind of things, stores, if you have an account like, you know, with Macy's or something, you know, anything like that, you have, you've signed something, okay? If you have a credit card or a bank account, you've had to sign stuff. Again, this stupid thing with signing everything. And that creates a legal link. And you need to pray and break any unrighteous soul ties with your bank, with your credit cards, with uh, your, like, department store cards, Anything of that nature, uh, again, your mortgage lender or your, your landlord, whatever it might be. Because all of these things, you're, again, dealing with a whole lot of people you don't know anything about spiritually. I mean, you can't go to your, your bank and demand that all the people you deal with at your bank become born-again Christians and keep the commandments of Yahweh. It ain't going to happen. In the same way, you can't demand that your landlord be a Christian. You can't, you know, demand that all, you get my point. It's simpler to just pray and break, ask the Lord to take the sword of the rock and the battle axe of Yahuwah and smash, crush, cut, destroy, and obliterate any unrighteous soul ties, legal ties, or contractual links between yourself and these various corporate entities. Because let's face it, most of these big banks are owned by, you know, profoundly wicked people that might even be fallen angels or Illuminati, I mean, you know, whatever it might be. So you need to do that as well. Okay, now, that brings me finally, that, that whole package there is un, unrighteous soul ties. That brings me to this final thing about the weapon. And I want you to understand this, because the sword of the Spirit has been the go-to weapon in many a Christian's arsenal for generations. But in the past 10 or 15 years, the Ruach has shown us, and sometimes through the help of uh, other people, uh, colleagues in the ministry, these other weapons that are offensive weapons. And for something like this, unrighteous soul ties, the premier weapon I already mentioned is the battle axe of Yahuwah. And I'm going to take you to where that exists, and I'm going to just read a brief passage to show you how this all hangs together. In Jeremiah, the prophet Yermiahu, Chapter 51, he starts out talking about how awesome Yahuwah is and then how, you know, vain and useless these idols are. Starting in verse 18, he, he says, they, this is the prophet speaking about idols, they are vanity, the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Yaakov, of Jacob, is not like them. 
for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. Yahuwah Tzavot is his name. Thou art my battle axe and my weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. With thee will I break in pieces the horse and the rider, and with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and the rider. With thee, notice this, with thee also will I break in pieces man and woman, and with thee will I break in pieces old and young, and with thee will I break in pieces the young man and the maid. Okay, we, it goes on. But, and yes, in the literal sense of this, he is talking about the prophet. The prophet Jeremiah is his battle axe and his weapon of war. But, on a deeper level, he is saying, the Almighty, the Most High, I have a battle axe and it is a form of my prophetic word. And with it, I can smash in pieces nations. I can smash in pieces kingdoms. Uh, and down in verse 22, he says, With thee also will I break in pieces man and woman. That's saying that he can, with it, sever the link between male and female if it is not set apart. And then it talks about young and old. With that, it talks about severing the, any unrighteous soul ties between the generations, between father and, and son, between mother and daughter, between grandparents, etc., Okay, and finally, with thee, I will break in pieces the young man and the maid. And that is, of course, referring to, you know, adolescents, perhaps people that aren't married, but they they made the mistake of, of fornicating, of going out and performing sexual acts with one another when they're not married. And this shows us the power of this weapon. Beyond, There's nothing wrong with the sword of the spirit. It's a marvelous powerful weapon. It's a surgical weapon. That's why it says in Hebrews 4 that, you know, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, even in dividing asunder of, you know, the bone and sinew and marrow and spirit and soul and so on. But the battle axe, you know, it's kind of a difference between the battle axe is less nuanced. It's more powerful. And if you've ever watched like some old movie or even a modern movie where you've got in medieval combat and somebody has a battle axe. You know it's not a subtle weapon, but it's a very powerful weapon, and it can just, you know, chop off heads. And and that's why, in the light of these passages, especially verse 22, we believe that we can prophetically take the battle axe of Yahuwah and the sword of the Spirit and use it to sever unrighteous soul ties. In any of these contexts that I've been mentioning for the past 40 minutes, you can just shatter them to smithereens. You can break them. You can destroy them. You can shred them into a million pieces and destroy the power of the enemy to seep into your life and influence you and take away your victory, to take away your joy, and to take away your shalom. And we recommend using both. So the battle axe of Yahuwah is a bigger, powerful weapon. And it, I believe it can be especially used to break unrighteous soul ties. Now, beyond that, there are other weapons like the arrows of deliverance and the, the rod of strength and so on. We're going to hopefully get into those and maybe do little teachings on each one uh, through this channel later, so please stay tuned. But for now, I hope I've covered the whole spectrum of um, the unrighteous soul tie. And again, I want to iterate. I'll just say this to close. With a lot of these relationships, they can be entirely innocent. I'm not trying to cast aspersions upon teachers or pastors or anything like that. Many of them are, most of them are great people. And many of our childhood friends are great people. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if you aren't certain of the other individual's spiritual condition, either then or now, you need to just to be on the safe side. Take the sword of the Spirit, one hand, the battle axe of Yahweh on the other hand, go to our website, pull up the Breaking Unrighteous Soul Ties prayer, and just fill in the blank, you know, with whatever particular relationship in your past or your present that you may want to pray about. Maybe you have many. Most would. 
because most of us haven't lived our lives in a cave. Most of us have, if, if, you know, if you're like 25, 30 years old, you probably have dozens of relationships of some form or another. Clean them up. Use the power of the Ruach and the sword of the Spirit and the battle act of Yahuwah to cleanse yourself so you can keep yourself defiled and undefiled and unspotted from the world. Hallelujah. You will have greater victory in your life and you will walk with joy and shalom and power before man and before the throne of Yahuwah. If you find these teachings helpful, powerful, edifying, please share them with friends. Please subscribe to this channel and please also pray about supporting our ministry because we are an entirely faith ministry and we need your support. We appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you. May you be richly blessed. Shalom. Shalom. <music>